Good morning, everyone. Beautiful day, isn't it? You know, we're all about getting people following Jesus. Uh, We want to help people find Christ and uh, give their lives to Him. Then we want to see people being changed by Jesus, uh, discipled, uh, spending time in the Bible and uh, growing in in our faith. And then we want to be on mission with Jesus. Uh, We want to see people equipped to go out and and minister during the week. Uh, The church can't possibly create enough programs to fill the city of Portland with the fullness of Christ. That has to happen as we go out during the week, all the people we see, the people in our lives, uh, sharing with them about Christ. This is the second in a series of messages called Beginnings, based on the book of Genesis. Uh, Whether you're a teenager, senior citizen, single, or married, it's important to understand how this world began. As we talked about last week, the Bible does not begin with Genesis. It begins with Jesus. It begins with the empty tomb. After Jesus was crucified on the cross, hundreds of people came on the streets of Jerusalem and said, we've seen him alive. The tomb is empty. And so they began to document the life of Christ. And uh, these uh, letters, uh, these uh, Gospels, uh, when they were all written, became known as the New Testament. They were combined with the uh, books of the Jewish Scriptures, uh, the Old Testament, to become our Bible today. Had Jesus not been resurrected, chances are you would have never read Genesis. Paul was uh, called by God to take the message of the resurrection to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. A big struggle for Gentiles coming to faith was having to uh, put away all that they've been taught in the past and to believe that there was one God. Uh, Up until that time, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians believed there were many gods. But Christian says, no, there's only one God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Gentiles came to faith, they became interested in the Jewish Scriptures. Uh, they, weren't, they were looking for Christ in the Old Testament, uh, prophecies about Christ, uh, the backstory to Christ. They opened up Genesis. Turn in your Bible to Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible, pretty easy to find. It means origins, uh, beginnings. And so the first line says, In the beginning, God. Gentiles were shocked when they read this. All they'd been taught was, in the beginning, the gods. In the beginning, the first line of the Bible says, God created the heavens and the earth. Moses said the world had a beginning. The world began with God. A Christian faith grew rapidly in the Middle East into Asia, Africa, and Europe. It became the dominant worldview uh, throughout the world. In the last three centuries, another worldview has arisen, vying to take prominence to to shape the future of the world, secularism slash atheism. This worldview postulates that there is no God. Uh, This may be what you believe. I'd like to contrast these two world views today, Christianity and atheism. Uh, Parents, this is a great uh, thing to have a discussion with your kids. You know, what's the difference between atheism and Christianity? So let's talk first about the, the major beliefs of atheism. One, there is no God. This summer I read God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. Uh, Christopher Hitchens uh, died in uh, 2011. Uh, He wrote about 30 books. He was one of the leading uh, speakers for atheism. Uh, In his book, you just kind of see an utter disdain for Christianity. Uh, God is not great is his case for there not being a God. Some chapters are pretty good. Some I thought were rather silly arguments like uh, Christianity supports and cause slavery. I mean, come on. Slavery predated Christianity by centuries. Uh, Christianity has been the leading voice against slavery in the world. Uh, Another chapter was about Christianity as the source of racism. Uh, Again, when Christ died on the cross, 
People that come to Christ, everybody stands equal before God at the cross. People from all countries, all ethnicities have become followers of Christ. Uh, One of his best chapters is uh, about evil in the world. He says, there can't be a God because no God would allow so much evil in the world. It's actually his best chapter, hardest one uh, for us to answer. We don't have time to talk about that today. But the second uh, tenet of secularism is the earth and humankind came about through the process of evolution. Schools teach that evolution uh, came about as the result of scientific inquiry. That's not fully correct. Uh, It came about due to the assumption that there is no God. Evolutionary thought begins with the a priori assumption that there cannot be any uh, supernatural intervention in the natural world. So it's an attempt to explain the world without God. Three, third tenet of secularism, the earth and humankind came about by chance. Uh, The world and humankind emerged from non-life forms uh, through chance mutations. Biochemist Michael Behe uh, teaches at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, and uh, he used microbiology to try to refute uh, Darwinism. He produced various uh, irreducibly complex mechanisms. There are thousands, uh, like uh, cellular structures, blood clotting, Uh, the eye. Um, He showed that a bacterial motor, a flagellum, uh, has about 30 to 40 parts uh, that have to be work in coordination uh, to create complex protein parts. Uh, He compared that to a mousetrap. I brought one along today uh, from my garage. Actually, this is a rat trap, but it's the same idea. And uh, there's probably only uh, 10 parts on this thing, maybe less. But Behe says, you know, if one of these parts is missing, you don't get a mousetrap that catches half as many mice. You don't get a mousetrap at all. It doesn't work at all. And then he tried to to show uh, that it's a mathematical impossibility for the 30 to 40 parts of a flagellum to have been produced by chance, mutations, gradual modifications over the years. In 1982, uh, Cambridge astrophysicist Fred Hoyle and Cardiff University of Wales professor Chandra Wakram Singh, both atheists, uh, knew enough about science to know that Darwin's theory of evolution uh, was preposterous. So they ran the numbers to determine the mathematical probability of basic enzymes arising by random processes. They concluded that the odds were one-to-one followed by 40,000 zeros. So utterly minuscule to make Darwin's theory of evolution absurd. Yet in spite of the lack of evidence of single-celled life forms evolving into more complex life forms and the improbability of life being explained by random mutations Over billions of years, evolution has been taught in our schools as a fact over the last 60 years, as our state religion. I call it our state religion because the the Supreme Court in 1961 in Torcaso v. Watkins ruled that like other religions, like Buddhism and Taoism that do not teach belief in God, secularism is a religion as well. So, you're talking with a friend, and your friend says, you know, you, you, you have faith, but I believe in science. And you can respond, you know, actually, you are living by faith too. You're living by faith that there is no God, and that this all came to be by chance over millions of years. That's faith as well. In 1987, in Edwards versus Aguilard, the Supreme Court struck down a Louisiana law that required that intelligent design be taught in schools equally with evolution. They struck it down because they said the backers behind teaching intelligent design obviously want people to believe in God. And so they said that's unconstitutional. So, if you have two viewpoints two primary viewpoints in our country, Christianity and atheism, and you've struck down Christianity uh, being taught as uh, or 
uh, intelligent design being taught as unconstitutional, you're left with the other belief as our national religion. The fourth tenet of secularism is the earth is very old. Uh, atheists typically take refuge in the belief that the earth is very old. Given enough time, they argue that anything can happen. Over millions of years, even billions of years, the unlikely becomes likely. The improbable is transformed into the inevitable. And for a while, biologists got away with this. Only because the number of years they invoked were so immense that nobody could understand what could happen over millions of years. But the computer revolution put an end to the theory that millions of years could rescue the possibility of the earth and humanity coming together by chance. Mathematicians began writing computer um, programs to simulate every process under the sun. And they cast their eyes on evolution. They simulated the trial and error process of Darwinism uh, over the equivalent of billions of years. The outcome was jolting. Computer analysis showed the probability of evolution by chance is essentially zero. Now, maybe you've played this game with one of your kids or, uh, you know, a five-year-old or a six-year-old. You're 70. So how much is zero times one? Zero. How much is zero times 10? Zero. How much is zero times 100? Zero. And on you go. How much is zero times a million? Zero. That's essentially what they did. If evolution is essentially a zero probability, it doesn't matter how many years you multiply it by, it's still essentially a zero possibility. 1966, a symposium at Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, a group of computer specialists presented their findings to the nation's biologists. Chard was led by Murray Eden of MIT and Marcel Schutzenberger of the University of Paris. At first, the biologists were angry at computer uh, analysts invading their territory, but the numbers could not be denied. And after the symposium, chance theories over millions of years began to be quietly buried. If it's not enough that the theory of evolution, such low probability multiplied by millions or billions of years is still essentially zero, uh, we've asked uh, Dr. Bart Rask to address uh, the subject of carbon dating. Carbon dating is the scientific method for determining that the earth is very old. And he's going to look at the foundations uh, of that. That'll be uh, in the spring. All right, let's look at the main beliefs of Christianity. One, the universe and humankind were created by God. So Genesis starts off, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, <clears throat> John, in his gospel, begins, in the beginning was the word. Uh, the word is uh, John's... Uh, title for Jesus throughout his gospel, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And then back to Genesis, uh, verse 26, chapter 1, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, over all creatures. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then chapter 2, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The scientific uh, community wouldn't even begin to catch up with the first uh, line in Genesis in, until a Belgian priest in 1927 uh, came up with a theory called the Big Bang Theory. Th found, scientists found that in a, just a moment of time, the universe expanded from nothing to the huge, massive size it is today. So this shows how, science's inability to explain all that we see without belief in God. Uh, atheists like Christopher Hitchens tried to make the case that science and Christianity are at odds with each other. 
But it turns out that many of the leading scientists through the centuries, particularly the 17th century, who made major discoveries were devout believers. Uh, The idea that there is a God and that, that there's intelligent design to this universe is the basis for scientific inquiry. If you believe everything's random, happens by chance, you kind of lose your whole basis for the study of science. Two, Christians believe the amazing design found in the universe and humankind is best explained by God. Psalm 19, in the, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 1, read this with me. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So our universe has intricate design. Uh, I'll just give you a few examples, like DNA. It's so complex to believe that that came together by chance. It's very difficult. How about the temperature? Uh, The sun is 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the earth's heat comes from the sun. Uh, The earth is 93 million miles from the sun. Uh, If the earth were 50 degrees cooler or 50 degrees hotter, all life would disappear. So why is the sun 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Why not 120 degrees or 120,000 degrees? Why is it just 93 million miles from here? What if it was half the distance? Because all of life would cease to exist. Is it possible to believe this is by chance? How about rotation? The planet rotates 365 times each year as it passes around the sun. Suppose it rotated 36 times. Well, then our days would be 10 times longer, oppressively hot, and our nights would be 10 times longer, frigid. Is this rotation by chance? How about oxygen? Oxygen comprises 21% of of our air. Why not 4%? How about 10%? What if it was 50%? If it was 50%, if you lit a match, the whole earth would go up in flames. Is this 21% by chance? How about the ocean? Uh, The ocean is the world's thermostat. Um, Takes a large amount of heat or a loss of heat for water to turn into ice and takes a huge amount of energy for water to expand and turn into steam. Uh, The ocean is kind of the cushion against the heat of the sun and the frigid temperatures of of winter. Uh, The the ocean uh, modulates the the temperature of the entire earth. Uh, You go down to, you know, Cannon Beach or, or Seaside, you stick your foot in the water. I don't care whether it's January or July, it feels about the same, right? It doesn't change all that much. It's the cushion in this world. Is that by chance? Christians believe that it takes more faith that to believe the intricate design of this universe is caused by chance than to believe it was created by God. You say to your friend, okay, you believe in science? You actually have more faith than I do. I mean, to believe this all happened over years by chance, that takes more faith than what I believe. Three, Christians believe the common sense of right and wrong that all humans share is best explained by God. Apostle Paul, chapter Romans chapter 2, says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Uh, We all have this natural tendency to pass judgment on other people. Where do we get that? Where do we get this sense that something somebody else has done is wrong? Well, Paul goes on. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, so non-Jews did not have the 
Old Testament Jewish scriptures, they do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Paul says the reason everybody passes judgment on others and has, and has this sense that certain things are wrong or right is because God has written His moral law on every human being's heart in this world. Think about children arguing. Jordan and I have nine kids, so I feel like I'm a, kind of an expert on this. You know, I hear my kids say, hey, that's my seat. Get out of there. Hey, get your hand out of my chips. Those are mine. Hey, you're wearing my shirt. Take it off. Get out of my bedroom. Well, they're not, when they say these things, they're not just saying, you know, what you do displeases me. They have a sense that what the other person is doing is wrong. It's not right. Where does this come from? After World War II, uh, world leadership set up the Nuremberg trials to put on trial leaders of Nazi Germany for killing six million Jews. It was based on the assumption that there is a common worldwide sense of right and wrong. Now, if the Germans did not know right from wrong, then the whole Nuremberg trials would have been nonsense. I mean, we can't condemn them for putting to death six million Jews if they didn't know right from wrong any more than we could condemn them for the color of their hair. Uh, People almost universally uh, agree that we should care for the poor, the sick, the vulnerable. Uh, Where does this sense of compassion come from? You can't explain it with evolutionary naturalism. The survival of the fittest suggests quite the opposite. You survive by leaving those who slow you down behind, the sick, the vulnerable. You could argue that this sense of right and wrong maybe doesn't work because there have been differences between different civilizations' beliefs moral systems over the years, but that's really not the case. The amazing thing has been how similar ethical codes are in different civilizations around the world through history. No one's ever said that, uh, you know, you should put yourself first. No civilization has uh, uh, praised selfishness. People have disagreed whether, you know, you can have one wife or four, but no one said a man can have any woman he wants. Uh, Suppose you're walking and you hear a person cry for help. You think two things. One, I should go help. The other thing you think is, nah, it could be dangerous and I could get hurt. Now, of those two thoughts, probably your strongest one is, I probably ought to just just pass on by because I don't want to get hurt. But then there's a third thing that goes through your mind that says, even though you want to stay safe, you still ought to help anyway. Where does that come from? Where's the sense that we ought to have compassion, even if it might be dangerous for us? Now, if you believe that there's a God who planted right and wrong in all of our minds, so we understand this sense of compassion, then it all makes sense. But if we are products of chance, random mutations over years, we wonder why sacrifice my life for somebody else who's just a random combination of molecules. If we're both, when we die, that's the end and there's, it doesn't matter if we show compassion or not. Then it doesn't make any sense. Secularists believe that there is no God. The earth and humankind came about through evolution. The world and humankind came about by chance, and the earth is very old. Christians believe the world began with God. Christians believe God created the universe and humankind, and the amazing design in this world and the sense uh, we all have of right and wrong is best explained by God. Which makes the most sense to you. 
If it makes best sense to you that God created the world and you've never put your faith in him, you can do so right now by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, asking him to be your God and your Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the first two chapters of Genesis where we learn about beginnings. We learn from the Bible, which you claim to be your word, breathed into the writers, that you say that the world began with you. I'd like to give you a moment to talk to God. If you believe in God, thank him that you can have confidence that the world began with him through creation. Um, And uh, tell him that you believe in him and you put your faith in him and in his son. Um, If you have questions, tell him about your questions. I'll give you all just a, a minute to pray. Thank you, God, that uh, we can see that faith in you is not something that's just kind of silly, but is quite possibly the best explanation for the world as we see it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.